Um, so today we have Jack Bradfoot presenting on artificial intelligence. He's a first-time presenter, so but he knows CompSci really well, so you can ask him clarif uh, clarification questions, and you can try to challenge him a little bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what is artificial intelligence? Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah, so artificial intelligence is uh, its a field of computer science that is kind of focused on creating computers and programs that are able to perform intelligent tasks or tasks that would historically require some sort of um, like human-like intelligence. So an example of this would be OK Google or Siri, which are both personal assistant programs on your phone, right? You speak to these programs. And then these programs are able to understand what you've said to them, uh, kind of process what you've said, and then either execute whatever function you've asked it to do, or return some data to you, or basically a myriad of functions that would kind of are simplified by this computer. Um, and another thing that my paper is going to touch on is machine learning. So machine learning is a it's the ability for a program, for a computer, to learn from feedback given to it and basically adjust its structures. So that way, it adapts kind of when it gets a certain input, the program is able to adjust and produce the specific output wanted. And it's able to kind of dynamically change its structure as it goes along. So, my paper is called Mastering the Game of Go with Deep. Neural Networks and Tree Search, or in layman's terms, ready computer algorithm to beat the world champion at Go. So, I'm sure you're all wondering, what is Go? Go is a game that originated in about ancient China, and it was mainly, main, mainly located in China and Asia until it was popularized by Japan in the 15th century. Um, in about the 15th century, it started spreading outside of Asia, into mainly Europe, where now it's one of the biggest games in Asia and Europe. Um, it's played on a 19 by 19 grid, so if you guys are familiar, I'm sure, with the game of chess, the Go board is about twice the size of a chess board, so just keep that in mind. So how is Go played? Go is played, players take turns placing their colored tiles onto intersections on this 19 by 19 so the goal of the game is then to control the most territory. And that's kind of an abstract kind of goal. Um, you never really, when you see play the game, can tell like, what your territory is. But basically what happens is as you play these tiles, you start forming lines of your little tokens. And then that kind of starts to divide boundaries on the board. That's not really that important for the rest of my presentation. I just wanted to give you guys kind of overview of what the game is. So if you guys have any questions about the game of Go, you can ask them. All right. Um, and kind of another thing to keep in mind is the amount of legal board positions for a game of Go is 2.08 times 10 to the 170th, which if you compare that to the approximate number of atoms in the universe, is that number is only about 10 to the 80th. So there are an incredible amount of board positions. And all board position is is just a slight variation in what the board looks like. So maybe in one board, a piece is shifted one space over to the right, and you end up with that many legal board positions. So that's just another thing to keep in mind. So what is AlphaGo? AlphaGo is a computer program developed by Google DeepMind. It is that tries to play the game of Go. It is uses a combination of neural networks and tree search algorithm to look at the board and kind of eliminate possible board moves until it picks the move that will lead to the highest chance of success or victory in this case. Um, and I'm sure you guys are all wondering what tree search and neural networks are. I'll explain that in a moment. So what makes up AlphaGo? As I said before, AlphaGo is made up using neural networks and tree search, and it also has to have some sort of board recognition component. 
So the board recognition, AlphaGo uses a camera to get a 19 by 19 image of the board, which then it passes on to these neural networks, which then will kind of go through and eliminate move choices, and then eventually it'll narrow it down so that way it can pass those few select move choices into a uh, tree search algorithm, which is then able to pick the best move. So now I'm going to explain what neural networks are. So neural networks are a computing model that is based on the brain. Um, and neural networks are kind of important because their brain-like structure actually allows them to learn and adapt um, using machine learning. And basically, this allows them to programmers, it saves them time having to go in and write a bunch of code because they're able to kind of create this structure and then provide it with kind of examples of what it wants this neural network to output when it's given a certain input. And then that way they're kind of able to speed up the training of these neural networks and also provide outputs that maybe they wouldn't have foreseen beforehand. So here down at the bottom is a neuron, a diagram of a neuron that would be found in a human brain. And the two important parts to note are the dendrite tail, uh, the dendrites and the axon tail. So the dendrites are connected to the axons of other neurons. And when these dendrites are activated by other neurons, an electrical impulse is sent down through the axon tail to activate other neurons. So further downstream of this kind of in the, in the brain and the system. And a neural network neuron has the same kind of structure. It has an input and an output. And it has, it adds up all of the input values and then outputs whatever value when this neuron is activated to the rest of the neurons downstream. So here's a diagram of a moderately simple neural network. So you can see there's eight input neurons here. And these neurons receive input from the program so whether it be like pick a picture um, or some sort of data set. And then that each of these neurons is connected to the neuron in the following layer. So you can see this neuron has connections to all of the neurons in this layer. This, these neurons have connections to all of these neurons, and so on and so forth. So just to kind of take a step back and explain why neural networks are so important. Um, kind of a, the way that these programs are written is a very kind of simplified to if-then logic. So if this certain clause is true, do this. And here you can see the just kind of abstract example of this program. If you have blue, then output square. If you have green, then output circle. And if you have red, output a triangle. And the program would have to go through and enter all of these different clauses. And while it may seem pretty simple, pretty straightforward for these three cases, when you have something like Go, where it has 2.08 to times 10 to 170th possible board positions, going in and entering what to do for each of those board positions is not feasible. So here you can see if red is passed into the program, it goes through and then it would output a triangle. But neural networks are able to, when they're given a specific input, that input can be passed into the neural network as some sort of mathematical abstraction, as some sort of mathematical version of that input. And then it gets passed through the neural network and whatever it's trained to output is output. So in this case, if you pass in red, it's going to output triangle. If you were to pass in blue, it would output square. Um, and to kind of explain it more in a mathematical sense, um, here we have just one input neuron with a value so this value of 1 is being input from some sort of outside source. Maybe let's say that's a white tile on a Go board. This neuron, this input neuron, maybe only has one outgoing connection. And this outgoing connection is going to have a value. And this, this value is the weight of the connection. And all that means is that's how much this neuron is going to have, how much of an effect this neuron is going to have on other neurons downstream of it. So in this case, 70% of this neuron's value is going to affect this neuron. And this neuron, in this case, only has one incoming connection. 
So its value is just going to be whatever value is passed across this connection. And in this case, that's this point 0.7 here. And then inside this neuron, it gets passed through a function called a sigmoid function, which you can see down here. And basically what this returns is a number between 1 and 0. Uh, and basically the larger the number is, the closer to 1 this function is going to return. And the closer to, the further from 0 on the negative side, the smaller the number is going to be. So you can see here, when we pass 0 0.7 through the sigmoid function, we get 0 0.67. And then, again, this neuron is going to have an output to more neurons downstream. And maybe this time the connection is only 0.3. So 30% of this value is going to be passed on to the following neuron, which in this case you can see is 0.201. And then again, that value is passed through the sigmoid function to return this 0.55 output. So back kind of to the abstract terms, if we were to say one represents the color red, and then maybe this neural network would then be <coughs> trained so that maybe 0.55 on an output would represent triangle. And the way that they were then able to kind of train these neural networks, train them to learn and kind of adapt their structure is by adjusting these weight values. Because if you were to adjust one of these weight values, a different value is going to be passed into the following neuron. The sigmoid function is going to return a different number, and then that's going to propagate downstream, so it'll give you a different output. So here is just a kind of bigger example. Uh, there's Instead of one input, there's two inputs. Instead of one in the middle, there's three, but there's still one output. And you can see all of these connections are going to have different weights, and that's going to create these different outputs. So does anyone have any questions on neural networks? Can you explain the difference between um, what a programmer does and what a neural network does? Sure. So here, as I said before, a programmer, in this case, a programmer would go through and enter all of these different clauses. They would say, OK, if we receive this input, do this. If we receive this input, do this. If we receive this input, do this. What neural networks are able to do is they have this structure here. And when these neural networks kind of are trained, the programmers are able to say, OK, when, we, when you receive this input 1, we want you to output this value, this 0.55 value. So the program then goes through and adjusts these weight values. So maybe initially, before the neural network was trained, maybe these values were 0.8 and 0.2. And that would output a completely different value here. Maybe it outputs something like 0.3. The program would then goes through and say, OK, well, we are outputting 0.3, but we want to output 0.55. So what we need to do is kind of adjust these values so we output this value here. And when this program is trained enough times, these values become so that whatever is, it is given, it outputs whatever it's trained to. So the programmer can train this when it sees green to output a circle, when it sees red to output a triangle, when it sees blue to output a square. It's the same neural network, but because of that training, it's basically able to adjust these values in the middle so that way it's outputting the values that it wants. Yes. So it's the machine is able to then, it runs through, and it, there's, it's like a complex mathematical thing, but basically it's able to adjust all of these values, so that way it produces that output. Right, so you give it an input, it says circle, you say wrong. And then it goes it through. Input, it says triangle, right. you say right, you adjust the values. Exactly. So any other questions? Yes, so I mean, when they, in my paper, they trained it 30 million times. So it, it, gave it, 30, it gave it 30 million examples, and it just went through and automatically trained itself. Yeah. OK. And so the next kind of part of the program is the tree search. And I'm not going to get into the tree search that they used in my paper, because it's pretty complex and requires a more advanced level of computer science knowledge. But 
basically, in this case, can anyone tell me what the pattern they see in this tree? So, 8 is the root node, and then it kind of branches out from there. So, does anyone see a pattern here? No? Okay. So, here, at the root node, is the number 8. And basically what happens is, when it goes to the right, when it's given a number, any numbers less than the number at the current node go to the, are put to the right, and any numbers greater are put to the left. So you can see, like if we were trying to find the number 7, is 7 greater than or less than 8? Okay, it's less than, so we're going to go to the right. Is 7 greater than or less than 3? Okay, it's greater than, so we're going to go to the left. Is 7 greater than or less than 6? Okay, it's greater than, so we're going to go to the left again, and we end up here at 7. So this is just one example of tree search, but basically it allows a programmer to kind of organize the uh, different things by value. So in the case of AlphaGo, it basically assigns different moves a value based on how well it is, how many times that move is chosen by other players, and then it's able to go through and pick one that it thinks is the best possible move. So does anyone have any questions on that? Yes and no. I mean, that probability of winning is a bigger factor, but kind of when these neural networks are being trained, what happens is the moves chosen by other players have a higher probability of showing up. So, okay. Yeah. Just to clarify, so that means that um, when the computer is deciding to make a move, it's basically saying, did a player use this move to win, rather than saying, if I move here, then the next move is this, then the next move is this, and the next move is this, right. until I calculate a win. Right, right. So it's not going through and calcul like going through the playing the game. Uh -huh. It's just picking based on a probability of winning from this move. Could it calculate uh, like every possible move for a win? Uh, no, because that's because of its complexity. Uh, because there's so many more spaces on the board than like a game like chess, um, it would take much way too much time, computing power, to go through and check every single possible move and pick the best one that way. Is that why they picked Go specifically? Um, I mean, yeah, Go is one of the games where it is one of the few games that hadn't been able to be played by a computer. So yes, it's, it was just more of that this game was so complex that it was just one of the last remaining games. Okay. So now I'm just going to kind of combine it all together and go through how AlphaGo kind of picks a move. So you can see here in this figure, um, on a, a here, all of these little blue circles are spaces where the program could move. Um, and kind of as it goes through, you can see these blue circles are going away. So AlphaGo uses four different neural networks to kind of eliminate a lot of these moves. So they have two neural networks that are trained using, as I said before, 30 million expert moves. So it gave, they gave, okay, this board state and then trained it whatever move that the expert made. And then the other two neural networks were trained through games of self-play. So the neural networks would play each other, and basically it would encourage moves that led to a victory and discourage moves that led to a loss. And as you can see here, when they're passed through these different neural networks, these kind of blue circles uh, go away, and eventually down here, it might be hard to see, but there's two green circles. And then it, once it has these two green circles, it kind of goes through and picks whichever best move it thinks will lead to the best chance of victory, and then it makes that move. So how effective was AlphaGo? So the researchers, once they had this program, they had to test it against other Go playing programs, and they found that it performed significantly better than all of the other Go playing programs on the market. So in red here are all different Go playing programs, and on the y-axis, it's the ELO rating, which is basically just 
how well this program does, how well the program performs. So you can see here the red programs kind of peak at around 2,000, while AlphaGo is able to achieve almost 3,000. And the green is actually the European world champion. So after they had tested this AlphaGo, after they had kind of fine-tuned it, they actually challenged the European world champion to a five-game series, and they were able to beat him 5-0. So here, again, this is very confusing, but this is the final board state of each of those five matches. Just to kind of give you guys an example of how complex these games get. Why is there error in that graph? If it's playing a person and there's wins versus losses, so I would think you would end up with a number like 20 wins versus 40 losses. So why, why is there an error? For, for this guy, specifically? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure specifically for him. It might just be where his, his fluctuates. So this ELO rating is something that's given to you, and that's kind of like your rank in the go-playing world. So that, that might just be like where he fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. I don't know if this is right, but I'm just pressing where the go ends when one player gives up. Yeah. So... Um, in the 10 games that have been like broadcast against kind of like the world champion and the European champion, it never gave up. Um, well, actually, no, that's not true. It did give up one game. It gave up one game against the world champion. Um, but here, it wins four of its games by your resignation of the European world champion. So the European world champion just basically said, okay, there's no way I'm winning this game. So it just stops playing. In the first game, it won by 2.5 points. So it played to the very end of the game, and then they stopped playing. Um, so they, at the time uh, this paper was published, they had beaten the world champion 5-0. In March, they challenged the world champion in South Korea, and they actually beat him 4-1. So he, did, was able, he was able to win one game, but he lost four of the games. So why is any of this important? Um, I'm sure many of you don't care about Go. Um, I myself don't really care about Go. Um, but it's kind of important more on the artificial intelligence, machine learning side of things. So Go mastery was thought to be at least a decade away by leading programmers. Um, they thought that beating the world champion was just take too much computing power and too much time, that we would need much faster systems to be able to run a program that was capable of doing this. Um, and it's also, machine learning is becoming increasingly present in our daily lives. So an example of this, which shows up in the news almost every day, is self-driving cars. So a bunch of different companies, Google, uh, Mercedes-Benz, are all trying to kind of create the first self-driving car, the most effective self-driving car. And a lot of these, kind of, that program is machine learning. So this car is basically learning to drive. Um, not in the same way that Go obviously learns how to play, but it's the same kind of type of feedback, adjusting different values and kind of producing different results. And it's another thing that computers are better at than humans. So it was chess in the 90s and Go now. Slowly computers, well, I guess not as slowly anymore, but computers are beginning to take away things that humans were previously the best at. So just thank you to Amanda and Adam for running this every week. We wouldn't be able to do it without you guys. Uh, Kelly and Wesley for helping me with my big picture. Matt and Katya for data. Julia, Jesse, and Jake for the presentation review. Uh, Mr. D for mentoring me over the past year and a half and making sure I was prepared. Uh, my parents for giving me all the opportunities that they do and kind of encouraging me. And finally, to Sydney, Mark, and Claire for giving some idiot freshman a chance last year to get himself involved. I would definitely not be here without them. So, thank you.